In today's video, we're going to be looking at the characteristics of living things, which we can also call organisms. So basically, we're going to cover the set of features that all living organisms have in common. Whether it's an animal, a plant, a bacteria, a fungi, or a protoctist. Now, there are seven key features that you need to know about. And to help you remember them, we can use the acronym Mrs. Gren, where each letter stands for one of the features that you need to know. So those are movement, respiration, sensitivity, growth, reproduction, excretion, and nutrition. One thing to say before we start is that non-living things may also have some of these features. For example, a crystal can grow and a car can move. But the important point to remember is that only living things have all seven features. So if you start with movement, this one's pretty self-explanatory. It just refers to the ability of organisms to move. And that could be a whole organism, like a cow moving its entire body as it walks around a field. Or it could be something like a plant that only moves part of its body. For example, when it turns its leaves towards the sun. Next up, we have respiration. This is a set of chemical reactions that take place in our cells in order to break down nutrient molecules like sugars and release energy that we can use for metabolism. And if you haven't heard of metabolism before, it just refers to all of the chemical processes that occur within an organism to keep it alive. So basically, all the reactions that are going on inside us all the time. And respiration is what provides the energy that's needed for all those reactions. For sensitivity, we can describe this one as the ability to detect and respond to changes in the internal or external environment. So this is the idea that we can detect things like changes in temperature, which we can then respond to by doing something like sweating or shivering. But all other organisms can do this as well. For example, plants can detect water, light intensity, temperature, and a lot more, and they can respond to each of them. Something to point out here though, is that you might sometimes see this point as sensitivity and control, as the responding to changes part can be thought of as an organism's ability to control their internal environment. So basically, by detecting any changes, and then responding to them, they can control their internal environment, like their temperature, their water levels, their pH levels, all that kind of stuff. Next, we have growth, which is also fairly self-explanatory, and it just means that organisms can grow and get larger. Or in technical terms, we could describe it as a permanent increase in size and dry mass with dry mass just meaning the mass of an organism once you remove all the water. So for a cat, growth could mean going from a kitten to an adult cat. Or for bacteria, which is just a single cell, it just means going from a smaller cell to a larger cell. Then we have reproduction, which we can describe as the process that makes more of the same kind of organism, like a cat having kittens or a large bacteria, dividing into two smaller bacteria. Next, we have excretion. You might not be as familiar with this one, but basically it just refers to the removal of the waste products of metabolism, and also substances that are in excess of requirements. So if you break this down, the first bit means getting rid of waste products, like urea and carbon dioxide which we produce but don't really want. Then this other bit refers to getting rid of things that we do sometimes need, but only get rid of when we have more than we need. So this would include things like water and mineral ions. We need water and mineral ions to survive, but sometimes we have too much of them, so we have to get rid of the excess that we don't need. Then finally, the last feature on our list is nutrition, which is the taking in of materials for energy, growth, and development. 
So for most animals, that basically means eating and drinking to get all the nutrients and energy that we need. Whereas for a fungi or a bacteria, it would mean absorbing nutrients from the surroundings by either diffusion or active transport. And that's it. These are the seven features that all living things have in common. And anything that meets all of these criteria can be called an organism. One other thing that all living organisms have in common though is that they're made up of one or more cells. And we'll take a look at the structure of cells in another video. Also, remember that viruses don't actually count as living things. Even though some people call them organisms, they're actually not because they don't meet the seven requirements we just mentioned. For example, they don't grow over time and they don't excrete waste in any way. So they're not considered living organisms. Anyway, that's everything for this video. So I hope that was helpful for you. If you want to practice questions on this or anything else in science or maths, then head over to our revision site, which you can access by pressing the link in the top right corner of the screen. Otherwise, have a fantastic day.